morning, everybody. Um, good morning to everybody that's online and everybody that's here in the chapel. Um, my name is uh, Brad Yergin, and I'm a student of Robert Jeffers. And uh, the topic today that I was given to uh, talk about is Buddha nature is my higher power. And so typically, like, I've given two previous talks, and I was allowed to choose my own topic, and I was really happy about that because that's like something that I could kind of work with, and even though I was challenged, but this time I um, I was brave enough to ask him to jump over with me. And, uh, and so he gave me this topic, and I, and I had a lot of time to think about it, which is not a very good thing sometimes. <laughs> and I went in all these different directions, and, and I, it was, I, could, I think it would be good to talk about my process, but part of it was like I thought, oh, I'm going to define these two things. And right away, I got myself back into the corner. I mean, how do you define Buddha nature, number one? And then and then defining higher power, which is this kind of vague thing also is very hard to define. But so what I'm, um, so the, um, the direction that I kind of moved towards was not so much um, defining, but kind of relating to myself. Because defining would have been like me giving like a lecture like I was in school or something, you know, and talking about all these different things. And so from a personal standpoint, you know, I can divulge and I have in my previous talks that like I suffered from like substance abuse and alcoholism at a pretty young age. And this higher power reference comes from 12 step program stuff. You know, and some of the work that I feel like I'm doing with Baba Jimpa is he's kind of helping guide me, you know, in life. Dharma and recovery. And so that's where the higher power point comes from. You know, and then Buddha nature, you know, is, is this concept of the enlightened mind, you know? And so with those two concepts in place, you know, I'll, um, you know, I'll start with my talk. So, you know, I think, I think there are a lot of similarities between substance abuse and samsara. You know, because in substance abuse, it's kind of this exaggerated thing where you're grasping at something to make you happy, and it's causing you a whole lot of suffering. And you don't even really realize it because you're kind of all numbed out, and you feel like you're kind of escaping from, you know, this just painful life that you're experiencing. And I think in the same way with samsara is we're grasping at all these things that are trying to make us happy, and what we don't realize is they're causing us a lot of suffering also. And I, I really like um, the presentation of the, um, the eight worldly dharmas. And I got um, this presentation out of uh, Practicing the Path by Mr. Berkeley Shane. It's, it's a long run book that he um, wrote. And so the eight worldly dharmas are one, wanting wealth. And number two is not wanting wealth. Wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Wanting a good reputation, not wanting bad reputation. Wanting praise and not wanting criticism. Esteem and our life and, you know, a good reputation too. It's like, how can I go to work if I have a bad reputation? Like people won't trust me and I, and I won't be really reliable. But I think what I get from this is, you know, I want well. came because I was looking for like an answer to what was going on and why, you know, why was I not happy, you know? And, and so we have to really look at ourselves and look at where, where our position is and why, what we, how we feel about life. 
And I think that these uh, these eight worldly concerns kind of lead um, are a good way to assess, you know, kind of why we're ha why we're having some of the suffering that we're having. And so back to the topic of um, Buddha nature is my higher power. You know, with with my evolution of thinking about this, I thought to myself, like, so basically what this is saying to me is, is that Buddha nature is my refuge. You know, and that's that's kind of where I'm trying to go in terms of, of having faith, you know, practicing Dharma and, uh, you know, being kind of in, in a solution rather than in, in like a problem focused kind of situation. And so the thing is, though, is like most of my day and most of my life, I'm my refuge is in something else. You know, maybe it's Netflix and Hagen dazs That's where a lot of my refuge is. I come home from a hard day of work and I'm just like, man, I just want to escape. You know, I, I got all these problems I've been dealing with all day long. And and I come home and my kids and my wife and like, I just want to check out. The um, the problem with that, though, is it kind of potentiates, it increases my suffering and it keeps the suffering that I'm experiencing going. And so Buddha nature is my refuge is or my higher power is, you know what? Like, I always feel much better when I come home and do my a session, you know, which is kind of what I try to do. You know, I have a sadhana and a practice and I come home and I, and I, um, you know, before I get too into it with my family, I sit down and I do my session. And it's like, I feel like I have some resources that I didn't have before, you know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of looking towards a solution again. And so, you know, we talk about refuge with um, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And I really, um, I really kind of had to think about this, like, all right, I kind of know what the standard answers are, but what are we really like going to refuge? What are we really going for refuge in? You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I know with, um, with Buddha, you know, it, um, Lama always says that like, uh, Buddha doesn't rescue us. He, he gives us teachings, you know, and we're, and we're, the beneficiaries of the teachings and uh but i also you know even like you know we're a vajrayana center and you know when i um when i recite sadhanas and i and i do visualizations you know i feel something from it i feel differently you know than you know before i did it you know when i sit down and i recite mantras and i visualize something changes inside of me and i don't know if i can really quantify it but it um I feel more calm. I feel more connected. And in that practice of, of, you know, daily committing, you know, and, and, and maybe even daily failing too, <laughs> you know, daily committing and daily failing and, and trying um, is, is relying on, on uh, this concept of a higher power and Buddha nature. Um, the, um, the Dharma is a little bit more easy to quantify, you know, there are, there are all these teachings, you know, and and um, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming, but you know, there there's a whole multitude of different teachings and uh, different antidotes and different things that we can try to apply, you know, when um, when times are difficult and, um, and maybe you know, my mood is kind of low. Um, the sangha, which is a really interesting concept, you know, I uh, I practiced for a long time, you know, actually I practiced with a group initially and then I was kind of practicing on my own and going to teachings and, and then I, I found my way here, you know, and it's um, it's been really great to have people to talk to and people to, and listen to these talks and people to relate to. And I think we really, um, we really are a refuge for each other, you know, and it, um, and Lama is a refuge, you know, in terms of being able to give advice and and uh, and I, I think sometimes I don't take advantage of that a hundred percent. You know, we, um, you know, there's a group on Sunday that meets, or there are two, a couple of groups that meet on Sunday, and we kind of sit around in a circle and we talk about some of the challenges that we face and and the difficulties. And I, I really, um, it feels good to to talk about things, but it also feels good to hear what other people are doing and how they're solving their problems and dealing with the adversities in their lives. And so I think. Um, being a refuge for each other is really an important thing. So, um, so that kind of going towards um, 
you know, reliance on Buddha nature as a higher power, you know, refuge is kind of the beginning of that reliance. But I think on, on some level, um, there needs to be a little bit of a highlight of, of what Buddha nature is. And, and I, um, I started to kind of go into some, some of the books that I have and trying to come up with some quotes that reflect Buddha nature, but it, it, um, I just felt like I was just reading something, you know, and it wasn't, um, I wasn't really connected with it. But Lama says though, and, and this is maybe my, my evolution as a student, you know, where I kind of always thought like, you know, Buddha nature was this kind of like far off kind of distant thing, but Lama as a, you know, his quote was that, you know, we're always, uh, we're always touching Buddha nature at different times, you know? And I like that idea because, you know, there's always, there's periods where, you know, your meditation maybe um, goes well and you feel some peace and some connection, some deep thing that, you know, you're, you're touching. And I think that, that, that Buddha nature isn't such a far off thing, you know, it's something that's accessible to us. You know, and the teachings um, really point us in that direction. And so um, I think for me, it's easier to rely on um, the practices and the teachings, you know, than it is to, to sit down and have like this experience of like a spacious mind. You know, I don't, <laughs> sometimes I'll feel that. And I, and actually, you know, I've gone away on a couple of retreats and I really felt like I, I felt like really this spaciousness, you know, that I didn't really feel. But in my daily life, I don't really feel that. It's like it's there's a lot of monotony and a lot of like tedious stuff <laughs> that I'm doing all day long. And then I sit down to meditate and it's like, oh, my God, all this stuff is like flooding my mind. But um, so anyway, we have these different practices. And I think that um, the first one that I want to talk about is. Um, well, so when I was, uh, so Lama Jimpa said to me, he said, uh, it, you know, when I was like struggling with this topic, he said to me, it begins with bodhicitta and it ends with bodhicitta. And I was like, right on, that makes sense. You know, because, uh, you know, we need compassion to even be on this path, you know, and, and the whole idea is that we're, you know, we're striving for enlightenment to benefit other people. You know, and that and that base of that comes from compassion. And so, you know, I, I uh, when I was reading about, and I and I have this book by Rilpa Rinpoche, who is a um, teacher that I received teachings from. And he um, he was a pretty special person. He had uh, he was he spent a lot of time in Tibet after the Chinese had invaded, and then they he was in a camp or a prison basically and he was like massively tortured and there were a lot of different stories about all these horrible things that happened to him and uh, and you can just tell by his face like in his being in person it was like he was the most compassionate like person and just so like it was just like it was just like coming off of him you know and i was how could someone that was treated that badly you know how could they have this like this intense feeling of compassion and, and just the the talks that he gave and the empowerments and and so a lot of uh a lot of my faith comes from other people that have been practitioners you know and lama jimpa different lamas that come and give talks and so i think that um you know faith in the in the process and so anyway i'll um so we have two different um techniques to develop you know this bodhicitta um motivation and so the um, two different te the two different um, methods which we'll talk about here are um, the seven point cause and effect, and then exchanging self with others. And so the really cool thing about this is is that like these are the these are the methods. You know, it's not just some theoretical thing. You know, it's like if you do these practices, this is what will develop your compassion. And so the seven point is uh, recognizing that all beings as one's mothers and then the next um meditation and these are like these are analytical meditations where you um you take the topic and you you analyze it you know you think about it and then you try to develop this heartfelt kind of um single-pointed kind of uh mind 
So um, I'll start again. So recognizing all sentient beings as one's mothers, recognizing the kindness of mother sentient beings, um, repaying their kindness, affectionate love, great compassion, extraordinary intention, and bodhicitta. And so, and then the second uh, method is uh, exchanging self with others, equalizing oneself with others, disadvantages of cherishing oneself, the advantage of cherishing others, the actual thought of exchanging oneself with others, the meditation on giving and taking, which is the Tong meditation. So, you know, I um, I think I realized like early in life that like the self-centeredness was like, a, it was a lot of what had to do with my problem, being self-absorbed. And, you know, when I came to Buddhism, it was like, wow, you mean we can actually, uh, change like how compassionate we were i always thought people were just either compassionate or not that's just how they were and 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 when i realized that we actually had some ability to um to shift this idea of like being self-absorbed self-centered to being centered on other people you know and i've seen that in my own practice that the times where i'm other focused like I, i'm suffering less you know and an example of this was my wife was in the hospital and, and she was really super sick, you know, and I was, uh, I spent a lot of time in her room, just sitting there, you know, not doing anything. And I was really miserable, you know, I'm like, how am I going to take care of my kids? How is my life going to happen? I mean, what's going to happen in my life? And, uh, and I was just going around and around. And I swear I started realizing was, man, there's freaking seven other beds in this ICU. You know, there's seven other people that are in the same situation that I'm in. And I started realizing like, wow, there's all these other family members too. And they're in the same situation that I'm in, you know? And, and then I started realizing that, man, we're all in the same situation. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm in a different time and space, but like, we're all in the same situation. And, it, and you know what? I've used like these principles in many different in situations that are kind of like that, you know, in a similar way. And it's a, uh, you know, if, if this stuff isn't practical, then it doesn't really mean anything. It's just all a bunch of words, you know? So we have to, um, we have to try to glean out like the practicality of it. Another, um, uh, so both of these techniques rely on, uh, both of these techniques rely on us um, having kind of a balanced view towards people in general. And so it, um, I think this is really challenging, you know, I, you know, I work in a hospital as a nurse and, uh, and it's really super easy to have compassion for these little babies that we treat, you know, they're, some of them were just born, they're really super sick and their families are suffering, you know, and so it's really easy to have like compassion for those little children. But we also treat these prisoners that come from these state penitentiaries that are like some of these guys like have done these horrible things, you know, and I try not to um, even know what they've done, but eventually you know stuff comes out and it's like so so it seems like a tall order you know how do we have like this balance of view of people and i was thinking about it even with these prisoners i was thinking man they were little kids once you know they've done all these horrible things but they were little children once too you know just like i was you know and uh and even with, you know, and even with, I think the really challenging was how do we equalize ourselves? I mean, how do we have this kind of equanimity when it comes to politicians? <laughs> you know, that's a really tough one. And that's that's what we're tasked to do. Is we're tasked to try to to try to really do something that probably most people don't wouldn't even want to do, you know, because that almost like that polarized feeling feels kind of good in a way, you know, damn it, like that that's really wrong what they're doing, or or you know, but but so the so the thing is is that we have um, we have these techniques and you know I I think to try to um, to try to define Buddha nature is 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 not even like I'm not even going to try to do that but what I'm going to what I'm going to say is is that these practices lead to Buddha nature and they um, and they give us a little inkling of what Buddha nature is you know what I mean like like this this compassion that's far surpasses anything that we can imagine you know and and the cool thing too is is that we're we're trying we're not 
trying to go from like polarized like view to like all of a sudden being like you know super compassionate and like you know loving the world we're trying to get there like little step by step and we're trying to make little improvements kind of gradually at, at you know little increments of time and so um I guess, you know, as a result of uh, practicing, there's, there's, um, you know, some like spaciousness and some openness and some shifting of, of attitudes, um, but there's still a lot of like, just being lost in samsara and being stuck at times and not knowing how to get out. And I think that Lama's advice is, is, um, is to not give up, you know, and to persevere you know, and to just keep like, like working with our stuff, even when you don't really want to, you know, um, diligence, I guess is what he said. Um, and then also too, it, um, you know, it's all, you know, I, I used to think that like, oh, I'm doing this to because I want to be happy. You know, it's all about happiness, but, but my view of happiness is a little bit distorted. You know, I mean, initially it was like, you know, take a bunch of drugs and alcohol and that was making me happy. And then it was kind of accumulating all these things in, in security and that's going to make me happy. But obviously I have a little bit of a distorted view on happiness, but I like, um, I like Lama Jipa's um, quote that he said to me. He said, like, Buddha nature is all about freedom. You know, it's about freedom and not, not, um, not being, you know, stuck with like, accumulating or or um or even the freedom to just be you know not not run from things and not try to hide from discomfort so um anyway it's all about freedom so i don't i mean my talk kind of ends there and i know it's a little bit early so you know we can either uh we can have a discussion or um and actually, that's good. So I could I could uh, open it up um, to questions from either people that are online, here in person, or you can have a discussion or questions that you like. Hey, I'll start. All right. Is this on? It's on. Yeah. Um, that was a great point at the end about freedom. That's like really wonderful. And I think that you also made the point, or at least what a point that I heard was that it's about choice. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can choose to cultivate compassion. You can choose to cultivate love. You can choose. I mean, it's an active choice. Faith is an action. Faith is like an action verb. It's mm. not like a, a something passive. And um, so I think that's what I'm hearing is that this is this is an action. This is activity, doing the practices and making the choices, and that's what eventually will lead to freedom. Mm. Is not being acted upon. Is that? I, I think absolutely. I think that's that's a great point. And I think even like love, we always think of love as a feeling, but love to me is an action. You know, like, you know, my father who was like pretty mentally ill would always tell me, "Oh, I love you, I love you," and it's like, yeah, you love me, but you don't really do anything to help me. <laughs> you know, or you don't really, you don't really show that you love. You know, and and to me, it's like love is like, and maybe that's this whole bodhicitta thing too, like. Like if we develop in real compassion for people, we want to like help them. We don't want to just sit there and go, wow, I feel so much compassion. <laughs> you know, it's actually, yeah, it's a, that's a good point. It's an action. You know, we're, we're, um, we're doing something and, and we have a choice too. That's the other thing. Like, you know, I, I, again, the analogy of coming home from work and just being like wiped and like, you know what, I have a choice about how I'm going to, what I'm going to do, you know, and we all have choices, you know, during the day about how, you know, how we're going to engage and how we're going to uh, practice. So thanks, Susan. 
What's the time? <laughs> we could end early. Um, yeah, that's true. Let's do that. Well, we'll go ahead. Off. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your talk that uh, covered a lot of things I think that we're all marinating with. That's why we're all quiet, I think. I mean, that's for me. A lot, there was a lot there, but um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, your practicing right after coming home from work. I have this a lot, too, where mm. when I do meditate, it's very difficult because I'm being bombarded by the to-do yeah. list and all the things that are going on that are distracting from the practice. So I just wanted to know um, maybe some tips or some things that you might have learned that would be helpful for mm. working with that. That's good. That's good. You know, I like doing like the concentration practices in the morning because it's like quiet and I feel like I have a lot of energy. And so like in the evening, I like uh I like doing like recite mantras and doing visualizations and, and imagining you know the Buddhas and the light and the mantras and and to me it's like it's still um it's still pretty challenging but for some reason it gives me like some energy you know and it feels like it kind of cleans all the the daily you know heaviness that I'm I'm carrying so that's I, you know the mantra recitation stuff I think it's and, and I guess it just depends on how much energy you have you know I mean I and a lot of times I. I'm just like, you know what, I can't do anything, you know, I just have to like, like vegetate, you know. And so, you know, I try to commit to it, but then also at the same time, I try to relax a little bit and go, you know what, there's times where you just need to like, just, you know, rest. So, thanks. Okay, so um, the first one is called Practicing the Path with Yangtze Rinpoche. <laughs> Does that help? No, I'm. <laughs> my, yeah, my mind. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Yangtze, Yangtze, Yangtze Rinpoche. It's spelled um, Y N G S I. And so he's the um, the teacher who um, is the you know runs the um, Matripa Institute in Portland. Yep. So he speaks really good English too, and he has a lot of um, videos on YouTube. And then the other one was uh, um, How to Generate Bodhicitta by Rupa Rinpoche. This, this, is, this is produced by Amitabha Buddhist Center in uh, Singapore. I don't know if that's very easy. It might be. All right, anybody um, online that has any questions at all? Or comments. Let's see if I can get the vision. All right. <laughs> I'll give it to Autumn in a second. I just had a thought. Um, there are Brad mentioned practices that he does, and there's other practices um, that um, are pretty effective that I think a lot of people do. There's a meta practice, yeah. loving kindness practice. And um, the four immeasurables. Yeah. Meditating on the four immeasurables, um, that those are really um, heartwarming practices. Both of those can really open it up and, and decrease fear. And um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then even we, we do Medicine Buddha here at the temple too. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a really great practice too, you know, and I think that um, there are times when, you know, you have a lot of energy and you can sit and meditate on your own. And then there are times where, you know, having a group and coming to do group practice is a great way to, to like get enthusiastic. Right. Okay, so another one, um, I, uh, I really admire people that are able to face addiction and recovery and, and have found a way out. I think all of us, whether it's been substances or any other type of activity, have looked for uh, ways out of samsara in places that don't result in freedom. Mm. So I, you know, first of all, really anyone who's gone through that, I, I admire, but, you know, 
I just want to know from your perspective, like, have you experienced a degree of freedom? And what do you see as the key to that freedom? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that, um, I think there are a lot of correlations between like substance abuse and addiction and, and just like us living in like samsara or I don't know, that seems like, it doesn't seem like it might the appropriate word, but that's just living our lives, you know? And I think that um, some level you kind of have to hit a bottom with stuff, you know? Like you, you do the same thing over and over and over. And it, um, it's almost like you have to come to some resolution. And maybe some of it is through the suffering that you're experiencing and going, you know what? I'm just so tired of doing this and it really is not working, you know? And you have to see that, you know, you have to see that like, you know, this isn't working. And, and you know what? I'll give you a good example for myself. Like, you know, like sometimes I deal with stress. I, I eat, you know, and I eat really like unhealthy, you know, and, uh, and I eat a lot of sugar, you know? And so then like all of a sudden, like, I kind of get away with it for a while, you know, and I feel like really crappy. And but then all of a sudden, like, I'm seeing like, oh man, my uh, hemoglobin A1C is going up, you know, which is like a real indicator that my health is suffering from this, you know? And I think that, you know, eventually we have, we suffer the results of that. It's, I mean, like it's karma, right? You, you, you're you you're gonna have some negative consequences, you know, with all the dysfunctional things that we do, you know? and and I think that we have to, on some level, we have to, we have to hit a bottom, but also at the same time, we have to like, we have to use awareness, you know, because that's what a lot of what goes into my like dysfunctional behavior or addictive behavior is like this unawareness, like just doing things without thinking and without being aware. And, and like with my food thing, sometimes I'll, um, I'll just stop like with all these cravings and this desire to just binge, you know, and eat bad. I'll stop and I'll go, man, like, what am I feeling? Like, why am I doing this? You know, like, like there's like a gap in between that we don't really see if we're not really like meditating and practicing. And I think that, that we kind of like get our consciousness gets a little bit refined to where we can see that gap of where we're just reacting, you know, and I'm, and I'm not very good at it because I still like, like I, you know, I still am, am stuck in it, but I think, I don't know. That's, that's, that's what I have to say about that, thanks. <laughs> hey, all right. I also too eat a lot, mm. like a lot, but I don't eat just sugary stuff. I eat literally everything I can get my hands on. Well, you're growing though. That's different. <laughs> yeah, you're growing. You're going to be, I'm sure you're going to be pretty tall too. So you need all that food. I'm, I'm no, already no I don't. Food. I eat way too much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I guess my advice is like, how do you feel? I mean, do you feel like you're eating to the point of where it's like, like over the top or is it just like, you know? Well, not really. Uh, I don't really know what that means. Well, you know what, too, is I think you had a point, like, like focusing on eating like healthy. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I do eat healthy stuff. And I don't know. Uh, oh, right, right. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that uh, you can't underestimate you know, you, you know, growing the activities that you're doing and, and, uh, and sometimes those extra, like wanting all that extra food is because your body's going through this huge change and you're growing. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but I just try to eat healthy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's my nursing advice. <laughs> It, says, it is on. I used to eat all the time because I couldn't feel a bottom. So I would, there was never any end to it. Louder. Yeah. Anyway, I used to eat a lot all the time because I could never feel full, literally. Mm -hmm. I think that was like a metaphor that ran through my life as a mm -hmm. child. 
Um, but a question I had for you was, do you think that um, that the uh, loving kindness and bodhicitta is something that's like a muscle, like the more you do it, the uh, absolutely. stronger it gets? Absolutely. And I think it, I think it requires like attention too. You know, I mean, I, even just doing this talk, I was, I was um, reading and thinking and meditating and I was like, oh yeah, that's it. You know, that's where we want to be. But then like, it's easy to, to get focused on your own stuff, you know, but, but you're right. Yeah, it is a muscle. And so the, t the difficult thing though, is like, man, we've got all these things that we're trying to focus on, <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we incorporate all these things? And I guess our, um, well, our prayer booklet, you know, has like all these little elements, but the problem is like being sincere, right? Like each time you hit one of these little sections about like bodhicitta or, I mean, being really there and being sincere, you know, I mean, it's tough, you know, but I think you're right. It is a muscle. It's something that needs to be practiced all the time. I think there's some hope in that, like, because then you can do little small actions mm. and get a little dopamine hit, mm. <laughs> you know, and you think, oh, well, I just did something and that, that felt really good. You know, I did it for somebody else and, and kind of learn to build on that. And instead of feeling like you have to, it has to come from a place of enlightened activity. Absolutely. So, you know, the other thing too, that, um, the Lama and I talked about, which I almost forgot about was like, there's a lot of energy in compassion. And so like, like right now, you know, being motivated by self and making myself happy and all the things I need and, you know, that, that wears you out, you know, like I, I'm worn out trying to be happy, <laughs> you know, but the thing is being coming from a place of compassion, there's a lot of energy. There's a whole lot of energy and we don't even really, you know, we don't realize it because it's hard to, to make that shift. But that's how that's how Buddhas are made, right? It's because they have this this compassion that's not fueled by their own self concerns, you know. Yeah, sounds good. Are there any other questions or comments from anybody online or? In house. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, guys. You got everybody's so kind here, so it's really easy to come and to give a talk. And but it's very um. It's very humbling. I think it, it's how it feels to me. Like, all right, you know, I mean, and that's a good thing. You know, I need. I think. You know. It's good. <laughs> okay, let's do closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen in life and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish and increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chen Rezu, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and resident goals. Lo Sam, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a string of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losandrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, everyone online. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was good. It was it was great. <laughs>